uh, in war zones, outside of war zones, um, around the world, um, are, are in the news. Uh, the issue is in the news daily. Um, it is an issue that the U.S. government is wrestling with. Um, other governments um, are developing technologies uh, that will allow them to carry out um, targeted killing. Some are, many already have them. And our job today is to sort of figure out some of the thorny international law aspects of these kinds of operations. And we have four experts here who, um, who by the end of this panel, will have made everything perfectly clear. Um, I'm Mark Mazzetti. I'm a reporter with the New York Times. And um, I won't give um, a, a long introduction um, myself, uh, or even a long um, introduction of the panelists, because we want to really dive into the to these issues. Um, issues such as um, where is it an armed conflict? Are targeted killings um, lawful? Um, uh, period. Are they are they are they lawful uh, inside of uh, an armed conflict? Does the consent of the government matter? Um, what about signature strikes, which are strikes where the target, specific target of the strike, is not known? These are all issues that we're going to be getting into today. By prior agreement of the panel, we decided that we would be um, confining our discussion. Um, uh, to um, the use of, of targeted killings outside of Afghanistan uh, because we thought that um, Afghanistan is, is, we would all agree, much more of a, of a traditional war zone. Um, uh, traditional military force um, is being applied and um, uh, what we really thought was more interesting was these places outside of, uh, countries outside of, uh, of Afghanistan. So, so we will not um, we thought it would be a more interesting discussion, and um, and and we wouldn't go down the rabbit hole just talking about Afghanistan. So, um, without further ado, let me just quickly introduce the panelists. We have to my right David Glazier um, of Loyola Law School, Marco Sassoli of the University of Geneva Law School, Hina Shamsi of the ACLU, and Daniel Bethlehem of the S. And I. Um, uh, I think we, we have a great group here, so I will start uh, uh, with a broad question, and um, hopefully we can um, um, start broad and get more narrow um, as we go. So the first question I had was to was to Marco, uh, and, and 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 let's get into this issue of um, is this an armed conflict going on um, in countries such as Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, uh, parts of North Africa. Um, each country is different, and each case is different, but um, is this an armed conflict, and are targeted killings uh, justified under international law in these places? Well, <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, as a lawyer, I nevertheless have to make a preliminary point, which is the question of the justification of the use of force, what you call normally the use ad the bellum, and there um, the possibilities are self-defense or consent, but even if it is justified under self-defense, self-defense is a, sorry for my friend Jordan Paust here, I fundamentally disagree with him, self-defense is a justification to use force against another state who used force, but not to kill an individual. That's whether you may or may not uh, kill an individual is either governed by international human rights law only outside armed conflict and in armed conflict by both international humanitarian law and human rights law and then we have to determine which prevails if they contradict each other. Now for humanitarian law to apply there must be an armed conflict. I must say I don't think there's a possibility of a worldwide non-international armed conflict, uh, but there can be an armed conflict and there is certainly an armed conflict, for instance, in Afghanistan. And so the real question is the link between these killings and the armed conflict uh, in Afghanistan some people say the geographical scope, and this is the traditional theory, I must admit, 
is a question of borders. So in Afghanistan, IHL applies. And if you want to know whether IHL applies in Pakistan, you have to determine whether there is an armed conflict in uh, Pakistan. And same thing, Yemen, Somalia, and so on. I have a certain tendency to think that the real issue is whether there is a link between the target and the already occurring armed conflict. So if there is someone in Pakistan directly participating in the hostilities in Afghanistan, then there is such a link and therefore the attack is uh, covered by international humanitarian law. The other possibility is a separate armed conflict, like we have one, in my opinion, in Pakistan, we have one in Yemen, we have one in Somalia, and then uh, there must be, to which the attacking state here, the US, must be a party for it to be covered by international humanitarian law. I think a drone strike alone has not the necessary intensity to make an armed conflict out of it. So either there is already an existing armed conflict and the US is a party to that conflict and then it's covered by international humanitarian law or it would rather be uh, covered by uh, uh, human rights law only, so my position would be the distance towards the hot battlefield does not matter. What matters is the link, and the link must be a very close one, not simply associate ideologically linked. It must be um, that, that the hostilities with the same, between the same parties take place on the territory of another state and then humanitarian law also applies there. So if the, uh, if you could not make a link uh, between uh, an individual in Pakistan mm. and the war in Afghanistan, um, then there is no justification for killing that individual um, uh, the, the, uh, under international law. Except, obviously, there is an armed conflict, in my view, in Pakistan, but then the U.S. must be a party to that armed conflict in Pakistan, and then, obviously, we come into the rules of humanitarian law. The person must be a legitimate target, proportionality, precautions, but there I have already to warn you that I consider drones a good idea once there is a legitimate target in an armed conflict. Okay. You know. Thanks, Mark. Um, and thank you to Marco for laying out a fundamentally important point, because oftentimes in discussions about targeted killing policies, um, the conversations go past each other because they conflate legal frameworks. And I think it's very important to start out by acknowledging the three different legal frameworks that apply. One, and, and I'm talking about international law here, so one, with respect to the legality of the use of force extraterritorially, the international law doctrine of self-defense, right, which goes to whether a state can use lethal force in the territory of another state. As Marco said, it's absolutely correct that the answer to that question doesn't relate to or answer the question of whether the use of force against a specific individual is lawful. That's governed by uh, human rights law and the standard there is that a person um, may only be targeted if they pose a specific concrete and imminent threat or under the laws of war, assuming that they apply, and there the standard is, is the individual in a non-international armed conflict um, directly participating in hostilities and are, are all of the other law of war requirements met. Now, part of the reason that we have so much confusion and talking past each other is that the Obama administration, while commendably acknowledging, including at ASIL, the importance of the question of legality um, and acknowledging how important it is that the U.S. be in full compliance with applicable law, unfortunately conflates and doesn't distinguish between its claims of legal authority. 
So in legal filings, in speeches, um, administration officials are very careful to talk about both authority under the AUMF, Authorization for Use of Military Force, um, as informed by the principles of international humanitarian law, as well as self-defense authority. And here we go straight down a rabbit hole, right? Because in conversations about the most contested notion in the public debate right now, imminence, what are we actually talking about? Imminence is a question for under the uh, doctrine of sovereignty. Is there an imminent threat um, to which a state may respond by using lethal force in another state? The most comprehensive analysis of imminence that we've seen is in the leaked white paper, which purports to summarize a far longer, um, still secret Office of Legal Counsel memo. Now, we're all at a disadvantage because we're not quite sure what kind of imminence is being discussed in that white paper. Is it imminence under domestic law? Is it imminence under international law? But I think what's very clear um, is that if that white paper is talking about imminence under international law, it's again confusing two different concepts because it appears to be saying that the use of lethal force would be justified even if a person, um, if, even if there's no clear evidence of an actual plot that's about to take place, um, and that is a determination that can be made by a single senior high-level official. Now, Sir Daniel um, may be able to speak more um, about the response abroad to this, but certainly in my conversations with policymakers and academics um, in Europe, there's a real concern of, are we talking about human rights imminence, right, in that context? Is the US saying that it is now redefining what imminence means under the human rights standard, or is it really only talking about self-defense? And if it's only talking about self-defense, then how is it justifying the targetability of particular individuals? So part of what I think it behooves us to do as a community of people devoted to or at least sympathetic to international law here in this hall is to really ask and seek answers from the government about what exactly it means and which specific legal frameworks it is applying and how it is seeking to justify the use of lethal force in places where the United States is not engaged in an armed conflict as that is traditionally defined, where there is duration, intensity of hostilities against an organized armed group. And if it turns out that as Marco says, the United States is in some countries intervening um, in an armed conflict that exists, that for example might exist in Yemen, Pakistan or elsewhere, then shouldn't the U.S. be making that justification? Because it's not the justification that it's making now. Justification the United States is making now is a conflation of law of war, self-defense authorities, leaving fundamentally unanswered, critically important questions for the public debate domestically, as well as abroad, and preventing meaningful accountability. And I say not accountability only in the legal sense, but also in in the public sense of when a nation state seeks to take life um, and, and needs to justify to the international community and its own public the legal basis for, um, for the taking of life. You mentioned Yemen and I want to d dive into this, the Yemen example in, in sp uh, specifically, but I first want to give everyone a chance um, for, the, for the opening argument. So Daniel, it's, uh, it's over to you. Thank you. And um, I, 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 there's going to be a great deal of agreement on this panel, I think, on very many things. And in particular, I have to agree with Baroness Shamsi to my, uh, to, to my right. I, I did there say, goes I, my ACLU credit. I, I did say to her that, uh, you know, I, I'm um, much more, uh, as it were, invulnerable to, uh, to slurs of high office than, uh, than, 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 than she is. Let me just make um, uh, th uh, three very brief framing observations and then come directly to the question. And as I say, I do suspect that there will be a great deal of agreement and certainly there's a lot that I, I will agree with or virtually everything that Marco and Hina have already said. On the sort of the three very brief framing questions, really just to put my own mind in order, 
I'm, I'm sort of taking it that there is a degree of stipulation, although this is not something that Mark mentioned, that we're really not talking about the legality of drones as a weapon system per se, that we're really talking about the use of the weapon system. Now, beyond that, it seems to me that we've really got two separate but important questions. I mean, one is what is the legal framework, and I agree that we've got to have an ad bellum discussion and then we've got to have an in bello discussion. And one of the concerns that I've had and that I'll come on to in just a moment is that too much of the discussion is, is about in bello and that gives that that generates all sorts of problems so we have to have an ad bellum discussion which is a discussion about self-defense but quite apart from the discussion about law the legal framework we have to have a discussion about wisdom because just because it's legal it doesn't make it wise and I think that there are very significant questions that need to be asked about the wisdom of what's going on and certainly my sense is that the debate um, over the course of the last six to eight months has changed rather uh, rather fundamentally and, and rather importantly this is without prejudice as to where it'll go and where it'll come out but we need to uh, we need to have that discussion and I should also say I suppose by way of further preliminary observation that um, you know, I'm based in London uh, it's rather um, the debate going on in the US is a very US centric debate driven by a number of factors which are very particularly US the targeting of US nationals the disclosure of of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of legal advice and all the rest of it. The debate going on out there, where I come from, is rather different and focused on, on some of the public international law issues. Now let me just um, then go directly, um, Mark, to your question and perhaps uh, tackle it from a slightly different perspective but agreeing with a lot of what Marco and, and, and Hina have said. And it seems to me that when we're talking about Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, elsewhere, Mali perhaps, that there are five possible scenarios out there and we, we really ought to stress test each one. The first one is the global armed conflict scenario. Um, are all of these armed conflicts uh, linked? Uh, second, and I suppose this goes to, to Marco's point, um, I would have underneath that as a, as a, as a sort of sep a separate uh, 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 scenario a much more limited extended territorial armed conflict scenario which, al which would allow us to link what's going on in the Fatah, in particular in Pakistan, to Afghanistan. But I think that that's rather separate from Yemen and Somalia. The third scenario is, uh, again as Marco has suggested, are there a discrete series of, of armed conflicts in different geographic spaces? One in Afghanistan, one in Pakistan, one in Mali, one in Yemen, one in, one in Somalia. Even if there may be elements of linkage, and that may be at, at, at a level of ideology, but are they discrete um, armed conflicts? The fourth one, and at the end of the day, as I'm going to suggest in just a moment, this is the one that I prefer, is forget about armed conflicts, forget about Afghanistan. Are there individual um, instances of imminent or actual armed attack? which allow military action to be taken by way of self-defense. So that's not linking them to, the, to an actual armed conflict going on. And then the fifth, which I think we need to ask ourselves as well, is are any of these uh, circumstances actually circumstances of uh, the use of policing power? And uh, uh, under, under policing uh, uh, regulations, one can use lethal force in circumstances in which there is an, an imminent threat to life. So I think we need to be asking ourselves those questions. And let me just in two moments and I'll be very brief, just, just give a, a, a kind of an answer to uh, the scenarios that, that I've identified. Global armed conflict, let me say right at the outset and I put this in print, I don't think it washes, I don't agree with it, I, you know, I don't think that one can make, uh, one can make that claim. I think that they're, they're, it's highly problematical as a matter of law and as a matter of policy. As a matter of law, I think that there is insufficient clarity on the global armed conflict uh, analysis, on the geographic scope, the temporal scope, and the personal scope of the conflict. I think it creates acute global, a global sense of vulnerability concerning the use of, U of force by the United States. And I think it just doesn't comport with the understanding of the people out there with whom we will need to reach a settlement about the basis of the force that, we, that, that, that is being used. So I have lots of problems with the global armed conflict uh, analysis. I think it's unwise and legally problematical. In terms of the more limited extended geographic armed conflict scope, in particular with regard to Pakistan, I think that there is something in that. And I think Marco's analysis of the linkage between the target and the Afghan conflict is a very important one. I don't, I don't think that we can, can downplay that. But I think that um, uh, we have to ask ourselves uh, some rather difficult questions there. 
The issue of whether there are a series of discrete armed conflicts in all of these spaces, well, there, there may very well be, and that's going to be a question of law and a question of, uh, of fact in Yemen. I think many people have suggested that there is an, 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 a civil war going on and that participation um, uh, involvement in some shape or form there with the consent of the Yemeni government may be, may be lawful. But the, 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 the one that appeals to me most in terms of the rigor of the analysis is the self-defense analysis. Are there instances, whether it's in respect of Mr. Alalaki or, or, or others, in which the, there is evidence, hard evidence of, of, of attack planning, which rises to the level would rise to the level of an armed attack if, if there was an, a, a, an actual attack, such as to allow action to be taken by way of the law of self-defense. That's the analysis that I think that we should be holding ourselves to. I think it's a high threshold analysis. It's a strategic analysis. It may still allow us to take action in those places, but it's going to be amenable to understanding by the people with whom we need to talk, because basically we're saying to them, we're attacking you because you pose an imminent threat to us, not because of some affiliation of status. Um, the issue of policing power, I think we can leave out there um, you know, for discussion later. I won't say anything more about it at this stage, other than that I don't think that it actually fits with the scenarios terribly well. Since we're all <coughs> we're bestowing ourselves with aristocratic titles, um, I will um, move to uh, Duke, Duke David Glazier. <coughs> Thank you. Um, although we're talking about international law and the international law criteria for an armed conflict are obviously quite important in establishing whether or not there are or could be armed conflicts going on in any of these particular locations. It seems to me that when we're talking about the legality of the United States participation that we also have to look to U.S. domestic and constitutional law. And the authority under our constitutional law for the president to be engaged in this use of force essentially stems from the authorization for the use of military force passed a week after 9-11. And I think it's important to note that that resolution contains past tense language only. So it's not a blank check for a large-scale global war on terror. It's a specific authorization for the president to go after those individuals or groups that were responsible for the 9-11 attack and any entities which harbored or sheltered them. And so it seems to me that as a matter of our domestic law, we're engaged in an armed conflict against Al-Qaeda as the group responsible for 9-11 and against the Taliban. And so when we're talking about the, glo the geographic scope of the conflict, essentially it seems to me that it's defined by the physical presence of, of members of those groups. And so Afghanistan is, is sort of a clear case, but we're not talking about that. There is certainly, we know, members of Al-Qaeda and the Taliban sheltering in Pakistan today. So it's certainly plausible, um, even credible, that some portion of the conflict going on in Pakistan is part of the armed conflict that the United States is engaged in. And one can debate, some people in this room do, I know, whether or not we can be engaged in an armed conflict with Al-Qaeda. But the international community as a whole, in terms of the UN Security Council resolutions authorizing the U.S. to use self-defense, or at least recognizing the U.S. right to self-defense after 9-11, and the fact that NATO found 9-11 to be the only armed attack in the history of that organization, coupled with the fact that the U.S. executive branch, congressional branch, and judiciary have all acknowledged legality of the U.S. use of force, it seems to me make this kind of hard to debate. But the harder issue is moving beyond that core conflict because a number of the strikes in Pakistan have been against groups like the Pakistani Taliban, which clearly didn't exist at the time of 9-11 and seem to me to be entirely separate political entities which fall outside the scope of the authorization for the use of military force. And the same with these other Al-Qaeda affiliates or, or spin-offs. It seems to me that there's a real hard constitutional question about where the president would get the authority to be striking at these groups given the fact that again they didn't exist at the time of 9-11. Uh, there are also serious international law issues about whether the conflicts in those countries rise to the level uh, of an armed conflict. So I think that there are both domestic and international law challenges. But I think um, that there's, one has a very hard time justifying the full scope of the U.S. drone program as being consistent with, with 
the law governing armed conflict because I don't think you can demonstrate that the United States has the legal authority to be in a conflict of this geographic scope against this diverse group of, of entities. I would note that in, in people use the term associated forces, but in both World War I and World War II, Congress felt compelled to declare war separately against each of the nations that the U.S. was fighting against. So it wasn't assumed that a declaration of war against Germany or against Japan and Germany was broad enough then to encompass any associated forces which happened to join the conflict later. So I think there are real problems um, with the current scope of the conflict. And this is a U.S. law question, but does it, do you believe that then argues for a, a new AUMF? Well, I go, now I think the international law question comes into play. In other words, can, does Congress have carte blanche to simply authorize the use of force against any entity in the world, or does the power to declare war in the Constitution, is it constrained by international law? Um, my personal view is that the framers used terms in the Constitution that had real meaning in international law, and I think, therefore, that international law concepts are implicitly incorporated into the Constitution. So can Congress authorize the use of forces that have not attacked the United States in the, the post-UN Charter era um, in situations that don't currently rise to the level of an armed conflict? I, I'm pretty skeptical. I think that the Congress would be exceeding its constitutional authority to give the President essentially a blank check um, to go after groups in situations which international law doesn't recognize as an armed conflict. Marco, you wanted to make a point on, uh, respond to D Daniel's uh, point about self-defense. Yeah, I was very much afraid in this panel that we would all agree. Uh, ask Daniel, indeed, uh, the both of us were afraid, and so I'm now very fortunate that I am able to disagree with one issue yes. Daniel <laughs> mentioned, the self-defense issue, because that's exactly what Hina rightly said. Either it's a question of self-defense in the sense of international law, as often defined by a case which is very interesting as a parallel in the Caroline case, and then it's for justifying the use of force by one state against the territory of another state without the consent of that state. Or it's an issue of self-defense in the sense of human rights law, which means that there must be one individual immediately threatening the life of another individual. While in humanitarian law, if it is an armed conflict, we certainly don't need that standard. Under human rights law, it is one of the most uncontroversial standards when a law enforcement official may use force to save his life or a life of another individual immediately threatened by an attacker. And I think it's essential to keep these two uh, concepts of self-defense separate. And even if an individual in a country abroad directly threatens another individual on my territory, the UN Charter prohibition of the use of force remains applicable. It's the normal reaction is to ask the neighboring country, there's someone who wants uh, to attack, please arrest him. Okay, and then there are exceptions and so on. But it's, I think, not useful to conflate those two except if that Daniel says, but that would be a very restrictive approach to targeted killing, that it's anyway only lawful if the targeted individual is immediately threatening the life of another individual in the sense of human rights law. And then I obviously can fully live with your approach, but I think it's too restrictive. <laughs> well, so we agree that it's too restrictive. Should I, should I come back on that? Well, and, sure. and may I go back on the AUMF point as, mm -hmm. as a, as a non-American? First of all, actually, I'm inclined to, to agree, in, at least in part, with what Marco has said. And you know, here am I straining to agree, and he's straining to disagree. So we'll meet somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, you, know, the def you know, first of all, I think that if one's talking about uh, about self-defense uh, internationally, let's 
you say, we've, we, we've got a sort of a glimpse of the 9-11 uh, attack as at, the, at the end of August uh, um, of, of 2001, and they're about to disperse. Uh, to my mind, that would rise to the level of, a, of, a, of an imminent threat of an armed attack, which would allow self-defense action to be taken abroad. I would agree, if this is an implicit part of what Marco has been saying, that the default presumption has got to be a use of policing powers in the state in question. In circumstances in which the use of policing powers would not be effective, for whatever reason, and let's not get drawn just at this stage, I'm sure we will later, into the unable and unwilling debate, but if it's not effective, then I think that that would rise to the level of self-defense as a matter of international law and would take us into this territory. Let me just also add a sort of point of clarification because I'm a little bit troubled by the way in which the sort of, the, not the dichotomy, but the two streams of analysis have been set out, uh, IHL and human rights law. As I understand it, human rights law does not authorize people to go, states to go out there and, and target and the taking of life. In fact, human rights law um, sets out remedies in circumstances in which that happens under Article 2 of the European Convention on Human Rights, for example, uh, and the requirements in respect of investigations. So I really am troubled by an analysis which says, uh, you know, you can take life on the basis of human rights law if it comports with human rights law. I don't think that that's the, that's the right analysis. Let me just make an observation about the AUMF, if I may be uh, allowed as a, as a non-American uh, sort of voice here, but sort of looking in at these things from, from the outside. I agree uh, very much with what um, David has said about the, the stress that the uh, AUMF now uh, 12 years old is taking. It seems to me terribly challenging and problematical to try and sort of read that language drafted in the, in, in the, in the days and weeks uh, after 9-11 to address every instance um, of, the, of the conflict that's been going on as a matter of US uh, domestic law. Um, there is a real issue, I think, though, about the idea of a renewal of the AUMF. And at one level, from the perspective of the stress that the current AUMF is under, one would want to renew it. But I think for many people, both inside this country and for those of us outside, fear that a renewal of the AUMF may be a broadening of it rather than a narrowing of it, uh, and maybe an extending of a sort of a, a, global, a globalized conflict. So I think that the answer actually is, for a greater intrusion of international law standards into the, the US domestic debate um, uh, around constitutionality and around uh, the legislative competence under the AUMF. I'd like to see much more, much more um, a reference uh, and perhaps deference in some instances to the public international law elements. There has been some of that uh, touched upon in some of the speeches of the uh, of the former um, or sometimes current uh, uh, Obama general counsels, but I think we'd like to see a little bit more international law. Hina, you wanted to respond. Yeah, I, I guess I'm, I'm still a little bit unclear, Daniel, on your meaning of self-defense and how you approach it. And in part, and, and just to let you know, you know, we had a prior conversation about this as we were setting up the panel and um, raised Daniel's uh, article in the American Journal of International Law where he proposes rules for the use of lethal force in self-defense. And my question to Daniel there, and I'll let you fill in, um, was aren't you conflating here questions of sovereignty and questions of whether or not a person is lawfully targetable? And I get your point about human rights law. It isn't permissive. It's restrictive. And, 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 and you're absolutely right there. And you know, your response was, no, the things like reference to you know, material support as a basis for uh, the use of force in self-defense is not about in bellow issues, it's not about law enforcement issues, it's about sovereignty issues. Um, and I've been thinking about that, and, and what keeps coming to mind is, is, is sort of a line from, you know, one of our, our famous philosophers, um, Marx, Groucho Marx, and you know he said, or is believed to have said, you know, who are you going to believe, me or your lying eyes? And the question is, are we talking about self-defense in your concept of it solely as an issue of sovereignty? Because that's what it's generally understood as. And if we can do away with that concept, then we can move on to the more interesting and complicated question of geographic scope of armed conflict, 
human rights application and so on. And there, I think, um, some very important issues come to mind as a, you know, as a principle of an international community devoted to the rule of law. Because even though we are all sitting here debating issues that are public knowledge, it is still the official position of the U.S. government that it cannot state which countries the U.S. is engaged in lethal targeting strikes. Um, it hasn't defined who associated forces are. It's plucked from the uh, neutrality context in international armed conflict, the concept of co-belligerency, but hasn't fully laid out what co-belligerency means in an armed conflict situation in non-international armed conflict, we still don't know the specific criteria for who actually can be targeted, who in the um, colloquial lingo counts as a militant or a combatant. Signature strikes come to mind here as a particularly problematic um, instance here, and although we know from John Brennan's nomination hearing that the U.S. conducts after-action reports of its targeting operations, we haven't had disclosed anything about whether civilians have died, in what numbers, and whether there's been any meaningful investigation afterwards or any kind of accountability afterwards. And I think those are issues that matter significantly, not just here to us, but they matter deeply in the countries in which we are carrying out these killings. We are alienating populations when we hide information or pretend to hide information. And I'd like to sort of get to those kinds of transparency, armed conflict, uh, geographic scope, um, issues if we can do away with self-defense. I want to do, <clears throat> to sort of wrap all, all of these issues into sort of a specific case because um, as we're discussing, these, these operations are going on, um, have been going on and have been intensifying for, for some time. And um, so the more we can ground it in specifics, I think the better. Um, the, the Yemen case I think is interesting because uh, we've seen an escalation of targeted killing operations uh, in Yemen in the last uh, three years. Uh, you have both the CIA and the Pentagon running parallel uh, wars in Yemen. There is um, the question of who, uh, the not only who is being targeted, but is this the United States participating in a insurgency in Yemen, uh, helping out the government of the Yemen? Um, is the United States targeting a group uh, of individuals who are trying to attack the United States, and so the self-defense issue gets in, um, comes into play. And uh, the president of Yemen has come out and said that uh, he uh, he approves every strike, and uh, that uh, you know the U.S. is doing this uh, to help out the Yemeni government. So those, with those facts, I'm wondering, um, Dave. Uh, what do you? Uh, what is your view on the legality of the targeted killing operations uh, going on in Yemen today? Well, I, I guess you want me to answer this in probably about two minutes, um, <laughs> and I feel like that this is sort of a two-hour question. Um, but it, it's either it raises sort of all of the issues that we've touched on and and, and some more. I mean, first of all, to, to harp back to my earlier point. It raises the question of sort of where does the president have the constitutional authority, particularly if what we are doing is intervening in a domestic um, armed conflict um, in Yemen. Um, it also raises the question of, you know, are there sufficient ties between groups in Yemen and those that fall with under, under the AUMF to, to bundle it into the, the existing authorized conflict? I think that's highly problematic. One of the things that we've seen in Yemen, though, is a real question about even if this is an armed conflict, who is targetable. It was kind of interesting to me that for the first several months of the discussion of targeting Anwar al every media reference to him and every government spokesman seemed to refer to him as a radical Muslim cleric. And yet a cleric is a protected individual under the law of war who can't be targeted at all. Now obviously the light went on somewhere in the administration because just about the time that we actually killed him, people started talking about him as having an operational um, role. Um, but this was very late, you know, this was an 11th hour addition to the, the conversation, which leads one to question sort of how seriously we're, we're, we're taking the law on this. I mean, clearly if we are in an armed conflict, then there is an ability to target 
enemy combatants as long as the killing is necessary, meaning it advances the, the war aims. But in irregular conflicts like this, the definition of, of what is a combatant obviously becomes very, very challenging. And we're, we're led more to look to sort of the, the, uh, the Geneva Convention idea of an individual directly participating in hostilities rather than a, a combatant. But that's not something that the United States has done a lot to define. And the fact that our military operates under a 1956 Law of War manual, which has not been updated to reflect any of these concerns, you know, raises a whole bunch of issues that, that we're not doing a very good job of, of debating um, in, in a very serious fashion, I think. Do you have to draw a distinction between uh, members of the Al-Qaeda affiliated group in Yemen uh, and uh, other individuals who might be enemies of the government of Yemen? Well, I think, I think that you do, and I think that's actually, I mean, to steal your question and deflect it, but that's been a real problem with respect to Pakistan because a number of the people that the United States has struck in Pakistan, including some of the strikes which produced the highest levels of civilian casualties that we know of, were targeted at people who are enemies of the government of Pakistan. And the same thing seems to be going on in Yemen, and, and the question then becomes, you know, where does the United States draw the legal authority to be intervening in those conflicts? As a matter of international law, we may be able to intervene in them at the, intervet at the invitation of those governments but it still draws very serious domestic uh, legal and constitutional questions. Hina, um, you spent a lot of time on Yemen. Uh, you uh, and the Iraqi case and the, and the case of um, Iraqi's son. Um, wanted you to, to respond to this idea of um, uh, the distinctions between a uh, members of an armed group, uh, members of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, and other people who may or may not be simply just government uh, enemies of the state of Yemen that the United States is helping them kill. So um, let me begin by just making the point that in our lawsuit seeking information about the legal and factual justification for the killing of Anwar al-Lauki and two other U.S. citizens in Yemen in 2011, the U.S. government takes the position that it hasn't confirmed or denied that it actually carried out those attacks um, and that in fact uh, in legal briefs the Department of Justice has taken the position that you know we've left open that Yemen might have done it. So part of what's going on here is the you know take into its conclusion the claim that the United States can kill people in secret um, and in the context of our due process litigation, um, the government takes the position that political question and immunity doctrines prevent any kind of judicial review whatsoever. So an entirely walled off area based on claims of secrecy and um, military uh, uh, exceptionalism to uh, transparency and, and judicial review. You know, I think that when um, Anwar al-Lauki was killed, I don't think that the situation on the ground was that you had an armed conflict um, in Yemen. Whatever the situation may be now, um, at that point, there wasn't the level of duration, intensity, organized armed group. Um, certainly the U.S. hasn't come forward and provided the kind of justification that we would look for um, to, to um, make its case. And so then you're brought back to the question of, are we using imminence in this context? And there I want to go to the white paper again, because this is what we know with respect to how these things are defined, at least with respect to U.S. citizens, right? With respect to U.S. citizens, the um, white paper, and I acknowledge all of the caveats that this is a 16-page summary, but this is what we have right now. The white paper says that um, lethal force may be used against a senior operational leader of Al-Qaeda um, and but it doesn't actually lay out more information about the following three criteria that must be met. That capture wouldn't be feasible, that the person poses an imminent threat. I already talked about why the definition of imminence in the white paper is problematic, 
and that um, the uh, other law of war principles are abided by. And this goes to the answer to your question, really, Mark, which is, and, and I'm not trying to skip this, the answer is we don't know. I can talk to you about what the standards are under international law, but what's really at issue here is how the United States is interpreting those standards and why it continues to keep them secret. We know that there are 11 Office of Legal Counsel memoranda, at least five of which address the lawfulness of, of killings of U.S. citizens. This is based solely on public reporting. We know that only five of those, those five with respect to U.S. citizens have been provided to members of Congress. We still don't know what standards are being applied to people who might be members of organized armed groups, what is the threshold for organization, what is the level of ability to engage in a threat against the United States versus the government of Yemen. Um, and I think one of our concerns has to be that what we know is so elastic with respect to a U.S. citizen, what happens with respect to the 4,700 other people that Senator Graham said have been killed in the targeted killing operation. So I'm coming back to you with a, this is an urgent need for real meaningful transparency, which the administration keeps promising, but not providing. And in that I agree. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, you know, I didn't make international law. Uh, don't look at me. but. Uh, the transparency issue, I think, is a very serious issue under U.S. domestic law, constitutional law, and I fully agree with the psychological effect on the populations if you don't know who is targetable. And with the rumors in these regions where everyone thinks that if he has or she has a grandmother who has ever criticized the U.S., he or she is a target, but if it is an armed within an armed conflict under humanitarian law, unfortunately, a state does not have to clarify the criteria according to which the state targets people because the criteria are in the humanitarian law treaties and then the rules of engagement must simply translate the requirements of humanitarian law. While in human rights law, transparency is essential. You violate the right to life if there is not a legal basis which clarifies who may be targeted. You cannot simply say, uh, I don't violate the right to life in the ICCPR, but I don't tell you whom I target. It must be clear. So there, there is a big difference. Uh, just on transparency, there is one small point where even in humanitarian law there must be transparency, and this is why the latest news that apparently the administration wants to move from CIA to uh, DOD uh, is in my view good news if they do it across the board. Uh, where we need transparency is in the accountability mechanism. Uh, because obviously uh, if the laws of war are violated then war crimes must be prosecuted and there cannot be secret prosecution. Therefore, we are told there is an accountability system within the CIA, but if, by hypothesis, they find someone who violated the laws of war, there must be a public trial against that person. And such a system doesn't exist. While it exists for all military personnel, and so this would be the first step to transparency in accountability. I'd like to get to this issue uh, next, but um, I wanted to ask uh, Daniel um, this issue, and I'm sorry, this is a basic question of international law, but the fact, but the, this issue of Yemen and Yemen's government and um, their supposed consent um, to, to the U.S. actions, um, how much does that matter in your mind about bringing us to the, uh, the, the, the legality of, of the U.S. operations there? Sorry. Well, you know, the, the difficulty in answering the question, and I suppose, I mean, David suggested that um, you'd need two hours to answer the question. I think I probably only need two minutes because at the end of the day, everything is going to be fact-specific. So my answer has got to be, it depends. 
It depends on the level of the threat and the specificity of the threat. It, de it depends on the actuality of consent or whether there is any uncertainty about consent. It depends on whether there are available effective policing options. Um, now, that being, that being said, um, let me say, you know, right up front, and perhaps some will agree with me and others will disagree with this. I don't have a problem as a matter of law or, frankly, as a matter of wisdom with the targeting of individuals who are far advanced in attack planning against us in circumstances in which we don't have any other effective remedies. I think that that's for the responsibility of governments to keep people safe. But within that sentence, um, there are a range of difficult questions. What do we know about the attack planning? How specific is it? You know, if it's going to be an attack, an, an attack plan which is I'm basically going to put, a, you know, a, a chemical agent that will sort of cause diarrhea into the water tank of a one of one house. That doesn't rise to the level of, arm, of an armed attack. If it's going to be taking over four aircraft and killing 3,000 people, that rises to the level of an, arm, an armed attack, in my view, and I have no difficulty at all, either as a matter of law or as a matter of wisdom, of targeting those people if there's no other effective means. And let me just pick up some of the points that Hina and, um, and Marco uh, have, have, have made. Um, I agree that, you know, particularly because this is a debate that is so acutely politicized and so important, not only for the sort of the College of International Lawyers, but for the whole of the population, that we need more transparency in the debate. And one of the reasons why I, since leaving the, uh, the legal advisor seat at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, have written on two or three separate occasions around uh, the issues of self-defense and, uh, and, uh, and strategic issues around targeting is precisely in order to stimulate that debate. I think it's very important that we have it um, on both sides of the, the equation. Um, and I, I, I like Marco's point about the importance of transparency around accountability mechanisms. That seems to me to be absolutely critical. There is one aspect around the U.S. debate which troubles me greatly, and that is around, and I know speaking to the New York Times and the ACLU, I'm you know, radically outnumbered, but happily on the left. Um, uh, and that is around the disclosure of, of legal advice. Uh, as someone who, for many years, was having to advise on precisely these issues within government, I do not agree with a piecemeal idea of the publication of, of legal advice. Uh, I think that the risks of, a, of pursuing a policy like that means that the lawyers will be asked less frequently, that they will um, be inclined to advise with less candor, that there will be less trust. I would like to be able to say to my, my political principles, who ultimately bear the decision-making responsibility. These are the issues. Um, these, are the, these are the strengths of the case. These are the weaknesses of the case. This is the consequence for you as an individual who may be subject to prosecution. Um, and the idea that, uh, that this would be on the front page of the New York Times, I think would have a chilling effect on, on the coherent legal advice that would be given. Now, that being said, I do think that it is vitally important for a government engaged in this kind of conflict and in this kind of public debate, that they put forward, um, not through leaked white papers, but that they put forward their legal rationale, not the legal advice, but that the government comes forward with through the attorney general or the, the in-house system, it's been statements in parliament by the foreign secretary or by the minister of defense or the attorney general, whoever. And they've said, we're going to war um, in, uh, in, in Libya. This is our legal rationale. We're changing uh, our policy in respect of detention in Afghanistan. This is our legal rationale. There ought to be that debate at the level of transparency, but I don't think that it should be the publication of legal advice. Um, uh, two other brief observations, if, I, if, I've got, if I've got time. One just is in respect of, of Hina's comments about um, the armed conflict in Yemen. And I note that she says, you know, at least at the time there was no duration, intensity, or, or organized um, uh, armed group. Uh, sufficient to rise to the level of, a, of an internal armed conflict. That may be the case. I, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not sure. I think that that's one of the issues of it depends. It's, it's a factual point. And then, the, and then the, the, the last point, perhaps, Mark, if I make it to come back to the, the earlier points that Hina directed at me on, on the question of, of, of self-defense and of sovereignty. Um, you can't take action abroad in the sovereign space of another state uh, unless one of three uh, conditions uh, is satisfied. The UN Security Council authorizes the action. There is a right of self-defense um, that is engaged as the gateway to the use of military force, um, or the state concerned has given consent. Now, on the issue of consent, 
there is a problem because that's not a full answer to the question. Uh, some years ago, there were um, trade union strikes in France. If President Sarkozy at the time had turned to Prime Minister David Cameron and said, we give you consent, come and use military force against the strikers, no one in their right mind would have said that that was lawful because consent can only address the issue of sovereignty. It cannot address the use of force in those circumstances. So there needs to be something more. And that something more seems to me to be the, 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 the attack planning or the attack that's, that's about to go on, which is why in the, uh, in the AJL piece that I, uh, that, that, I, that I published, it drew together these issues of consent, the issues of sovereignty, the issues of self-defense, because when you're in a position uh, as I was, those are the issues that the Prime Minister or the Foreign Secretary or the Defense Secretary turns around to you and says, well, what can I do? What is the law? Um, and it's not sufficient just to say, well, in, you know, in 1842, there was correspondence between Secretary of State Daniel Webster and, and Lord Ashburton, which laid down the Caroline principles. And the only thing that we've got is no, you know, um, instant overwhelming, leaving no choice of means nor moment for deliberation. You know, in those circumstances, a, a prime minister faced with, a, with, a, with intelligence which says that there is a real and imminent risk will throw up his hands and say, lawyers, leave the room. We don't need you. So there needs to be something with greater granularity around which the lawyers can coalesce. Hina, you wanted to jump in. I just wanted to say that I'm fully supportive of leaks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know we're running short on time, so I'm not going to respond to some of the other things, but I do want to just respond to your um, point about legal advice. And under, um, so there are two different sort of issues here. One is under our Freedom of Information Act, um, there is doctrine that says we don't have, and, and as a general democratic society principle, we don't have secret laws, right? So while deliberate deliberations between agencies are protected, when the government arrives at an interpretation of law that binds the uh, binds policy and under which it's carried out, then disclosure is required because otherwise what you would have is secret law. And that's really the principle that's at stake in our um, Freedom of Information Act litigation seeking disclosure of the legal memoranda that would apply to the killings of um, U.S. citizens. We're seeking the same legal memoranda with respect to non-citizens. We think it's equally important, but that hasn't advanced um, for all sorts of reasons we can uh, uh, bring up um, later on. I, I do want to get to questions, but um, I, I just wanted to, to uh, Marco brought up the point, and I want to just ask some of the panelists about it, um, because I think it's very interesting, because, and, it's, and it's very timely, this discussion of um, moving um, drone strikes, uh, which have marginally been the preserve of the CIA um, for more than a decade, to the Pentagon. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, from the panelists, um, does this matter in international law? Does it matter if a um, if the Pentagon, if, if 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 a military organization is carrying out targeted killings, or versus a secret intelligence service? Uh, Daniel. So, I, I, I think, and I mean, I, I've also, I suppose, like like Marco and others, seen a lot, lot of the um, discussion on opinion, Eurus and lawfare, and, and and the other blogs, which have suggested that. Um, uh, if there is uh, a, a CIA drone program, then at least the uh, uh, the uh, some of the, the the targeting decisions or, or decisions uh, or uh, or the, um, the the final endpoints of it will be taken by the military. Um, and I'm speaking with a high degree of ignorance here. But I think that to start off, we've got to ask ourselves the question: What is it that the CIA may be doing in terms of the targeting uh, sort of drone program, such that it may be? Um, uh, at one level, it may be the provision of of intelligence. At the second level, it may be the ownership of the hardware. At the third level, it may actually be flying the drones. At the fourth level, it may be the actual uh, sort of targeting a decision, the firing of the weapon. And I think that the answer is probably going to depend uh, on, um, well, the, the, the answer to your big question is going to depend on the answer to those, uh, to those smaller questions. Um, uh, there are, I think, a number of principles that will sort of apply uh, more generally, uh, notwithstanding these specific questions, and that is that whoever is undertaking this conduct, it's going to be military conduct that engages the international responsibility of the United States and the United States government, whether it's the CIA or the DOD. Um, uh, 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 the CIA 
um, if it is undertaking uh, such action, is either part of the US combatant force or they are civilians taking a, di taking a direct part in hostilities. So they will be uh, governed by the relevant use ad bellum and the use uh, in bellum. The, all of these principles will apply. And the US cannot avoid its public international law responsibilities by acting under Title 50 rather than under, under Title 10. I think that that's absolutely clear. Um, I'm not going to be drawn simply because I'm ignorant onto the uh, onto the issues of, of U.S. domestic law, and I'm sure that there is a, uh, a there is a, a legion of them. Uh, and I do suspect that there are bigger questions of wisdom around covert action when presumably it must be our objective that at some point we want to bring this war to an end um, rather than simply uh, prosecute it out into the future. So my inclination is to favor military action by military forces rather than military action by intelligence forces. Um, uh, in the United Kingdom, the, uh, the the CIA counterpart, obviously much smaller, rather different origin and rather different history, the Secret Intelligence Service, uh, doesn't have the uh, the uh, the authority or the competence uh, to undertake such activity. Here, the legal. I've seen those movies, though. <laughs> this, is, this is this is James Bond, yes. 007. <laughs> yeah, my, my telephone number used to be 008. So there we are. I very very quickly, I want to get Dave on this on this point, and then we we'll open up for questions. <clears throat> Yeah, it, it's funny that people seem to think that this is a hard question. So air warfare rules under international law are contained basically in the 1923 Hague draft um, regulations. And one of the very clear statements in there is that only military aircraft have the right to participate in hostilities. So the law seems pretty clear on this. Now, it's interesting that at Guantanamo, the United States is prosecuting individuals and incarcerating them for long periods of time on the basis that it constitutes a war crime for an unprivileged belligerent to participate in hostilities. So Omar Khadr is now in a Canadian prison serving his sentence for being an unprivileged belligerent participating in hostilities as a war crime. If that's a war crime, then everybody associated with the CIA drone program on up to both commanders and chiefs are war criminals. It, it's pretty open and shut. Now, fortunately for the presidents, almost every law of war expert I know believes that we have it wrong at Guantanamo and not at Langley. So I think that it's unlawful as a matter of international law for the CIA to be operating drones, but I don't think it's a war crime. I think they simply lose their the, they, don't, they lack the belligerent immunity that a military individual would have, and therefore they're common criminals under the domestic legal codes of all the countries where strikes have, have taken place. Um, so that's, that's part of the issue. I have to say, though, that transferring the operations to the military are not going to be a panacea, because one of the requirements under international law, I believe, is for a strict sense of accountability. Yet we've seen several instances in which drones produced unlawful fatalities in Afghanistan and the military was unable to hold the drone pilots accountable because the way we have it structured, we have an operational chain of command in the Central Command Theater of Operations. Drone pilots in the United States are under a totally separate chain of command and can't currently be held legally accountable by the chain of command concerned. So just putting these operations under the military is not going to be a solution even if it is a step in the right direction. And as we've seen, putting it in the hands of the military doesn't necessarily take care of the transparency issue either. Um, so uh, people are probably jumping out of their chairs, uh, <laughs> ready to, uh, to weigh in. So um, uh, please uh, state your name, your affiliation, uh, ask a question, don't make a point. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, um, my name is Noam Wiener. I'm at the University of Michigan Law School. Um, so the, the discussion about since 9-11 and early in other theaters has been dogged by um, executives carving out spheres of exception. So you had the um, illegal combatants and there, there's a numerous of those. And it, I'm wondering now when we're talking about imminence if we're not carving another such sphere. So I mean in, in regular human rights law when we're, not, when we're not in conflict, to execute somebody you have to have a court, you know, have a trial and, and then there's execution. Now there's an exception to that so if there's a, somebody running in here shooting up People, a police officer can shoot him immediately. But, Mr. Bethlehem, when you when you start discussing, you know, preemptively doing that, and this is to everybody, I think Mark also talked about this. How wide of discretion do you give before you actually end up with another sphere in which the executive can uncheck to do whatever they want, and we have no way of seeing what was done? I'm Jordan Townsend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do um, you want to respond, respond to that question? Uh, uh, sure. Um, Imminence is part of the law. 
we've got to give it some more granularity than, uh, than the statement in the Ashburton Webster correspondence of 1842. I mean, it seems to me that at the end of the day, when one talks about imminence, one's really talking about, uh, uh, in some shape or form, an assessment of, of, uh, of, of risk. Um, and in circumstances in which you faced, in, in classical terms, with an imminent threat, a threat that leaves no moment for deliberation is, and is instant and overwhelming, um, that engages uh, an, an assessment of risk. But it seems to me that in circumstances in which we're talking about modern weapon systems or we're talking about terrorist threats with people um, uh, uh, you know, uh, diffusing themselves throughout the population, that we've got to actually look at other indicators of risk which, are, which may be associated with, uh, with imminence. And so in uh, my uh, AJIL paper, I tried to suggest that there may be a number of other sort of possibilities that we should look at. So not just the nature and the immediacy of the threat, but also the probability of the attack. Uh, you know, you may have an imminent risk, but but really um, uh, a relatively low probability. Whether the anticipated attack is part of a concerted pattern of continuing armed activity. This was an, an issue that was addressed, but I believe in problematical terms, in the oil platforms case of the International Court of Justice. And Will Taft wrote on the record in the Yale Journal on behalf of the US government subsequently. The issue of the likely scale of the attack and the injury, loss, and damage likely, likely to result therefrom. I think the calculation of imminence has got to change if one's talking about a threat of catastrophic attack or a th or threat of a pinprick attack and the likelihood that there will be other opportunities to, to undertake effective action. People like Mike Schmidt and others you know, have written in similar terms uh, sort of over years. So I think we've got to give greater granularity to this concept of imminence. Just one second, Marco's jumping out of his chair very quickly. Yeah, it, it, I would just everyone in the room has understood that I don't agree with him because he mixes two concepts of imminence which are completely different. In the use at bellum sanks of imminence, I agree with his article, but this can never justify to target one individual. This is another issue, human rights imminence, and there is, it would be extremely dangerous to apply your standards, because if this is the standard, then it's the standard applicable to every policeman in Washington, D.C., in Geneva, and so on. And this would be the end of the right to life. <laughs> uh, okay, very quickly. Just, just one other quick point I think we need to consider, right? A lot of, there's been a lot of discussion about the due process required to add someone to the kill list. Now, does it need to be judicial? Is it sufficient to have this internal executive branch review process? In either event, if we have time for a detailed review process, how can these killings satisfy the, the legal standard for imminence? By definition, there can't be imminent if there's time for the government at the highest levels to talk about these decisions in the human rights sense. I fully agree. Um, I'm going to actually have a cycle through a few questions, um, and then we can get the panelists to respond. Yes. All right, I'm Jordan Past, and uh, Marco, I, I understand that uh, you disagree with Daniel, but I think Daniel has offered up for discussion, as he said in his article, some important points. If you can target certain people as a matter of self-defense under the self-defense paradigm, I think it would be quite useful to try to identify who is a DPAA. Who are the people that are directly participating in those armed attacks and are targetable? Isn't it useful to look to DPH by analogy, which I think he, he did in some sense, uh, and try to limit the types of people who are targetable under a self-defense paradigm? And Marco and Daniel and uh, others on the panel, we're not Europeans. We're not bound by the European Convention on Human Rights, which only allows the taking of life facially in time of war. We're a party to the uh, ICCPR, and Article 6 uh, does, d prohibits the arbitrary deprivation of life. I would argue that if someone is attacking United States soldiers in Afghanistan from Pakistan, it is not arbitrary at all to target those individuals as a matter of human rights law. But uh, as uh, Hina knows, Human rights law applies globally, but who does it apply to? Under the well-recognized criteria from the ICCPR, the CAT, and other human rights approaches in the Americas, for example, only those outside your territory who are in your effective control. Human rights law doesn't apply to drone targeting from 14,000 feet. They're not in your effective control. Marco, what do you think about that? Okay, next question. Thank you. 
Hi, um, I'm Mark Milanovic, University of Nottingham. Um, I would like to endorse Hina's initial comment, which is that this whole debate is plagued by conceptual confusion and conflation between the use and bellum, use and bellow human rights. Partly that's because the legal frameworks are so complex. Partly that's because we all use our intuitive judgment to leap to certain outcomes and results that we think are reasonable as a matter of policy. And I think that leads to an analysis which, in your words, Daniel, is not sufficiently granular. So to be more granular, let me suggest that we adopt an analytical approach which tries to do away with issues that are not relevant in that particular context. For example, one question I would like the panel to address is a, the following hypo. Assume you have some non-state group threatening with a terrorist attack. They're not Al-Qaeda, they're Buddhists, whatever, okay? Assume there is no armed conflict taking place in that state. Assume the authorities of that state consent. There's a flashing sign, we consent, whenever a drone flies by. That deals, Daniel, with your problem. So when you, when you said that, obviously, it's illegal for Sarkozy to consent to David Cameron killing his strikers. The lega legality there is not the Yusad Bellum legality, which is what we're talking about. It's fine. When Bahrain consented to Saudi Arabia to come with tanks and just kill whatever and uh, you know, suppress their uh, uh, rioters, that was perfectly fine as a matter of Article 2.4 of, of the UN Charter. Okay. So in that scenario, we want to kill somebody. What law applies, I ask you? The only law that I think can apply is human rights. And the question then is, do we apply the human rights standard that we apply in conditions of normalcy in peacetime in the same way in this sort of extraordinary scenario? Can human rights law in such circumstances accommodate the use of lethal force? I see no other option if you remove self-defense and you remove armed conflict. Thank you. Well, we'll take one more and then we'll get some responses. Hi, I'm Kevin Heller, University of Melbourne. And thank you, Daniel, for plugging up in your ears. Um, my question is actually, well, uh, is for Marco, but for everyone, and it's really an evidentiary question. And obviously drones are technology like any other weapon, but they raise some really significant issues with the principle of precaution and kind of precautionary measures in general. We, um, there is a presumption in civilian status for individuals. Certain civilian objects have a presumption in civilian status. And how do you think that the required and precautionary measures plays out in the context of drones? And are you concerned, and I guess this is the broad question, are you concerned with the evidentiary basis that the United States relies on when it decides uh, whether someone is directly participating in hostilities or is a member of an al-Qaeda group that is properly targetable? Thank you. Okay, uh, Marco, do you want to respond to that and as well as the, the first gentleman's question? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, Yes, I think drones are much better in terms of precautions than any alternative. Obviously, it, uh, targeted killings, this is what we want. The opposite to targeted killings is indiscriminate killings. Obviously, you will say, but make love, not war. But this, <laughs> this is use ad bellum. In war, it's lawful to kill people, but you should kill the right people. And their drones are better than any other weapon I know. Uh, because more precautions are feasible. Those who attack have no fear, no stress. They have more information because the drone can hover, compared with an aircraft or with artillery, for a longer time over. The target, they can interrupt the attack when suddenly children move in. They say, okay, we wait until the children move out. And they can make a post-mortem in the real sense. Once they have attacked, they have the pictures of what happened. And so they can learn. Obviously, all this does not clarify who is a legitimate target. Eh? And I speak here only about legitimate target. Again, sorry, Jordan. I don't think there are three categories, IHL, self-defense, and human rights. There are only two categories, IHL and human rights. Self-defense is either part of the human rights analysis or of the youth ad bellum analysis. And then for the human rights law issue of effective control, this is indeed a tricky issue. There are two possibilities. Either 
some people, including in this room, would say the negative aspect of the right to life, not to kill people. You don't need jurisdiction, you don't need control over these people. The, uh, the traditional uh, answer is nevertheless, if someone is not under your control, you don't have human rights obligations towards that person, which would mean that the victims of drone attacks outside armed conflicts don't benefit from any rules. And this cannot be the case. One solution is nevertheless that if the state consents, then these people have human rights towards their government. And the government may not consent to an attack which is in violation of human rights. And if the state doesn't consent, it's uh, governed by the law of international armed conflict and therefore if those are not enemy combatants the targeting is unlawful. Anyone on the panel wants to address these points or the second scenario, the, the attack by the Buddhists? Yeah. <laughs> yes, he looks to, look, Mark, you look to me about the attacks by the Buddhists. First of all, I agree with everything that Marco has just said in his previous answer, so there we are, we agree, but he will disagree with my agreement. Um, uh, and, and Jordan, let me say, um, I, I know very well um, to, my, to my cost that you are not Europeans. Um, uh, uh, there, are, there are interesting issues that, that arise there with, with regard to the relationship of the ICCPR to IHL and the US view on the application of the ICCPR, both extraterritorially and in armed conflict, and we could go on for another panel on this. On the uh, attack by the, the attack planning by the Buddhists, Marco, gosh, well, if you remove, you know, on conflict scenarios, you remove self-defense. I'm not quite sure what this Buddhist attack that you are envisaging um, might be, but as taking you at your word and, and, and assuming all of that, I agree with you that the right analysis then is what are the policing powers of the state and what are the human rights remedies that are available, assuming that the state in question that you are postulating is a state that is party to the ICCPR or other human rights conventions or other uh, human rights uh, law principles apply. So I, I'm, I'm agreeing with you there. Uh, yeah, quickly, and then we'll take a couple more questions. Okay, so um, on the evidentiary issue, uh, a week and a half ago or so, um, Jay Johnson, who is former legal counsel to the Department of Defense, was asked this question, you know, how much evidence does DOD need to have um, in order to feel justified that it's taking an attack. And he said, it's secret. We can't tell you. We can't tell you what the evidentiary standard is. Um, on, on drones, I think everyone probably on this panel agrees that drones are not unlawful per se in that they are not an unlawful means and methods of warfare. But I think the policy concern leads in turn to a legal concern. While I may agree with Marco that they can be incredibly precise, that you can take more precautions, what we can't forget is the importance of human intelligence in this context and how necessary it is to be able to have information about whether the person that you are targeting is the right person. And here, signature strikes, which we haven't really talked about, um, provide a very troubling and cautionary point here because this is where the rules come in. If the rules are that we are able to target people based on patterns of behavior without knowing their identity, then we are really in a troubling area where we are overturning the presumption of civilian status, assuming that we are in an armed conflict, and we have even more problems under human rights law um, where uh, strikes might be carried out in that context. Dave, quickly. Yeah, real quickly, I want to address the evidentiary thing as well, and also the, the signature strikes. Um, there's nothing wrong inherently with a signature strike because that's how warfare is always conducted. As a warrior, I never expected to know who it was I was going to be shooting at, simply that they were identified as a member of the adversary. The problem, though, is that the place where most of the signature strikes is taking place is Pakistan. And in Pakistan, we have militants who are threatening the United States. We have a separate group of militants threatening the government of Pakistan. We have at least one third group of militants being trained by the Pakistanis to make war against the Indians in Kashmir. So simply identifying someone as having characteristics of being militant does nothing to identify them as being a participant in the armed conflict that the United States is entitled to participate in. Just, we'll take two more questions in succession and then we'll get some answers. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tom McDonald. I'm from Pace Law School. Uh, just a couple of questions for uh, David Glazer. Isn't it the characterization 
of the war against Al Qaeda and associated forces? Doesn't it suffer from the same fault, same defect, as the war against terrorism? That is to say, Al Qaeda and associated forces can cover a huge number of people who may or may not be actively involved in armed conflict and can give a basis for a justification for a targeted killing attack. Uh, secondly, drones themselves, I agree with Marco. Yes, they are, they are certainly a, a, a more targetable in, in the sense they, they cause fewer civilian casualties than, for example, gravity bombed wood. But on the other hand, for a a highly industrialized state to use a drone attack with a, uh, a touch of a computer button 7,000 miles away against a group of people who are religious fundamentalists guided by the ethos of suicide bombing, doesn't that, to a certain extent, undermine the United States moral authority, more cause more blowback? than actually uh, a strategic advantage. And lastly, I must just ask Daniel Bethlehem about uh, attorney uh, General Peter Goldsmith's opinions. You criticize the public, making these public. But as you know, Goldsmith okay, published an opinion completely justifying the war in Iraq, the invasion of war in Iraq, without virtually any qualification whatsoever. Ten days before, as you know, he issued a secret opinion where he essentially said regime change would be illegal. Okay? He said, quote, unquote, a reasonable case could be made for the invasion, but we had to realize that, that it was you know, probably illegal without a second resolution. So is it really important that the press okay, can get access to that information? Thank you. Uh, last question. Thank you. We want one more. Oh, actually, um, well, I needed to make an announcement just in regards to the CLE for the session. Um, sorry. Um, as the session is ending at this time, we have to transition the scanners to the next session. Just make sure that you make your way back there at 1 o'clock because we have to move them to the next one uh, to scan out on your CLE. It is one. Yeah, so, um, okay. Just make sure Does that mean everyone has to leave immediately? No, no, no. Okay. Just have to Only the CLE. It's, okay. It's just do your CLE scanning so that yeah. we can transition the scanners. No job. Okay. Already Job. Okay, um, last question, then we'll get some answers. Um, my name is Joel Davis. My question was on the liabilities of Pakistan in this. Um, so, specifically in the case example of U.S. drone strikes in Pakistan, I was wondering um, if Pakistan was actually to acquiesce to some of these drone strikes, is there not the issue of the responsibility for Pakistan to protect its citizens, and are there liabilities with that? Thank you. Uh, uh, okay, so Dave, why don't you take the first one? I do agree that the idea of war against Al Qaeda and associated forces is, is essentially equivalent to the global war of terror. So I think first you have to chop off the associated forces, but then even membership in Al Qaeda is not sufficient to qualify for targeting. There are plenty of people in the employment of the U.S. Department of Defense who are not legal targets in an armed conflict. And so it's necessary to separately identify those members of Al Qaeda who are functioning in a role that's equivalent either to that of a combatant or a civilian directly participating in hostilities. And only those members of Al Qaeda should be lawfully targetable. Um, the Pakistan question, someone like to? I would say yes, absolutely. Uh, if Pakistan consents, it may violate human rights law, its obligations. You know? Yeah, I guess just on the on the global war on terror question, um, you know, I get this a lot. I think we all do. What's the difference between the Bush administration and the Obama administration's approach? And I think that the um, Obama administration has taken a different approach in terms of um, not a there's a black hole out there and no law applies as we had in the early years of the Bush administration, but saying here's the law that we think applies. Now, the problem with that is that the legal uh, framework that it is claiming is substantially similar because the definition, at least apparent definition of associated forces, co-belligerency, means that we're plucking from various different legal frameworks, self-defense, 
IHL human rights, the most permissive aspects of the authority to use lethal force without recognizing the limitations and limiting aspects. And there, I think, that's the most problematic part of what is going on. We're not applying and recognizing restrictions, and therefore, we are either violating or are in threat of violating humanitarian law where it applies in those very limited contexts and certainly human rights law everywhere uh, else. Well, uh, I'm sorry for those of you who still have questions. Uh, we have uh, a break that you can ask your questions individually to the panel. Um, and thank you to our panelists, uh, who I think did a terrific job. So. Thank you. Thank you.